Um, my name is Dave Dunham Kalsa, and I work as a digital media specialist at the National Park Service in town. Um, Sean and I work together on a variety of projects, and so just to uh, introduce you to the work that we do, um, I wanted to start by showing you a couple of the spots that we work. Um, this is one of the places we work. We work um, because we work out of the Morris Thompson Center. We work uh, with a variety of parklands in Alaska. We're not just uh, attached to the two parks in interior Alaska, which are Gates of the Arctic National Park, which is north of here in the Brooks Range, and Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve, which is all the way over uh, towards Canada, the border to Canada, and then it goes up into interior Alaska. Um, this is Western Arctic Parkland. Um, this is Bering Land Bridge National Preserve right here. Or, sorry, I should be pointing up here. This is Bering Land Bridge National Preserve, the midnight sun uh, in the middle of summer, last summer. We are doing a marine debris cleanup on the coast. So those are our tents right there. Those are the ATVs that we use to pick up trash. Um, another location that we... Yeah. Another location that we uh, work in is Gates of the Arctic National Park, which is north of here in the Brick Range, as I mentioned before. These are the, this is the Aragatch Range, uh, or the Aragatch Peaks, which is uh, part of that um, kind of central Brooks Range there. Some beautiful glacier lakes, if you can see it with the lights still kind of bright, but there's a glacier lake right up there, if you can barely see it. And finally, we work in Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve. Uh, that's the giant Yukon River there. It's so vast and beautiful. It's one of the uh, most beautiful places I've ever been to, especially in fall time, which we caught just the beginning of fall when we boated down the Yukon two years ago. And we also work outside of parklands, too. And this is the result of uh, collaborations that we have with other federal agencies and uh, nonprofit organizations. Uh, pictured right here, this is the National Petroleum Reserve of Alaska, which is operated by the, um, by the Bureau of Land Management. And uh, these are some interesting kind of formations in the tundra. Um, I can't think of the actual scientific name right now, but I know that I could be corrected by someone in the audience. So if you know of it, you can feel free to mention that uh, at some point. Um, but it's pretty interesting because they're, they're, it's basically an ice wedge formation. And so these, uh, there's ice that melts and then thaw, thaws and freezes and uh, basically creates these like giant wedges uh, in the tundra. And so I was flying around in a helicopter as they were surveying uh, yellow, yellow balloon nests up there. So as Robert mentioned in the introduction, one of the first projects that we did as a youth videography project uh, was filming Alaska's yellow-billed loons. And for those of you who don't know, yellow-billed loons are a very rare species of loon that nests uh, above the Arctic Circle. There's Scientists estimate that there's around 20,000 of them worldwide, uh, give or take. It's pretty hard to research them because they're so far north and the areas where they nest are so vast and so remote that it's difficult, it's very difficult to get people out there and equipment out there to actually conduct surveys and study them. So not really much is known about these birds. And so some of the scientists that work with the Park Service and Bureau of Land Management, they got together and decided that they wanted to make youth videography a part of their project. And so they got some funding together and they sent me out with some kids. Uh, and Sean was also helping um, with the post-production of these videos in Anchorage. And we um, had three uh, youth from different parts of Alaska. We had uh, Sam Taktu, who's in the middle there in the dark sweater. Uh, he's from Shishmaref, Alaska, which is all the way over on the Seward Peninsula. Uh, some of you may have heard that Shishmaref has been having some issues with uh, erosion lately, and they're considering moving their community. So it's a pretty, pretty uh, uh, interesting spot at this point in time. Andrew Kennedy is the youth on the right there, uh, in the, I guess that's green and gray sweater. Um, he's from Fairbanks. He goes to Effie Cochran Early College Charter School, which is right on this side of town, actually right across the street. <laughs> uh, he's, I think he was in ninth grade when this project happened in the very beginning. And then on the left there is Sam Burnitz, who's a youth from Anchorage. And um, he's 
been very interested in videography for quite a while and radio. And so um, we got these three kids uh, to go up with us to uh, actually to the North Slope, um, this private homestead. Um, so there's some people that live all the way up on the coast uh, in a place called the Colville River Delta. And it's a really, really small like little island in the middle of the Delta. And they've lived there for several decades. I can't think how many, exactly how many decades, but a long time. And they generously offered to let us stay at their uh, homestead as we filmed the birds in their area. And we also were able to interview them to understand from their perspective the changes that they've seen in their area. So I'll just play a little video for you here to show you kind of what the experience was like for the kids and for, for all of us. Let's open the video too. <laughs> with the aircraft and Colin took them under his wings literally and uh, let them get into the airplane and clean the windows and explain to them how the aircraft works and it was an added benefit that we hadn't anticipated that they would be exposed to that career field as well and then just to have make that strong friendship but they still have they still communicate the three of them today and that was a few years ago. So that's kind of the gist of the trip. Oh, I guess it's kind of loud. Sorry. <laughs> it's kind of the gist of the trip. As you can see, they kind of had a blast out there. We all had a blast. 
And you're probably wondering what the final product that they made was. So I'll just show you that video really quick too. One thing about a yellow bill is that they're definitely a, a majestic bird, large, and uh, once you've heard their calls, why well, you'll never forget it. We know that they that there probably weren't very many of them to begin with, that they breed in a very restricted area, pretty much north of 60 degrees latitude in big lakes on the tundra. The type of habitat that they use, the other loons don't, don't utilize. So they nest in deep water lakes where the other loons nest in smaller ponds and have to bring food into the young where the yellow bills normally are able to get enough food for their young out of the lake that they're nesting on. Currently, the yellow bill moon is being considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act because of its low global population size, its low reproductive rate, and concerns about overharvest. And that decision will be made in September of this year, 2014. Um, we've had a yellow bill loon, at least one pair, on our lake, on our property here every single year since families have ever lived here since the mid 1950s. In our immediate area, it really hasn't made a difference. They have stayed about the same. Some of the reasons that we are considering yellowbill moons as a species of concern are because they um, have a very small global population size. There's only 16 to 21,000 birds, and that's a very rough estimate worldwide. The analysis under the Endangered Species Act takes all that into account. What do we know about them in the past? What do we know about them right now? What kind of threats? or pressures do we think that species is facing and what can we say and how much certainty can we say it with about what's going to happen in the future. We don't have a lot of information about the birds when they're off the breeding ground. So when there are birds that are failed nesters or too young to compete for ideal nest site, we don't know very much about them. So if there was something like an oil spill or some catastrophic event that happened, we wouldn't have a lot of information about how those birds would respond or be affected. And so my role is to examine that. And we do that by taking samples and looking at those samples for the contaminants or the chemicals of concern that are in them. They are toxic. They can cause damage to, particularly to developing young, like bird embryos in an egg. In terms of the effects on the local people, we will need to be really proactive in working with folks who are subsistence users or recreational users in the area about um, the additional protections and considerations that we need to give the birds. The climate is changing and we've got some critters that we might not see anymore if the climate change continues to change. They're definitely a species of concern and probably will continue to be a species of concern. Those big arctic lakes on top of permafrost that they nest on, that whole tundra might be changing. We know that they're not very common now. We know that they probably were never very common. Uh, in the future, we kind of don't know what's going to happen. So that video was shown at the Alaska Forum on the Environment the spring after we came back from that trip and after we had produced the video. We, uh, there's a youth track that happens at the Alaska Forum on the Environment, which is a, for those of you who don't know, it's a, a pretty big conference that happens in Anchorage every year. And they have a lot of environmental topics that are presented there. So now they have a whole youth track and they get youth from all over Alaska to come and talk about issues, environmental issues that are happening in their communities or projects that they've done in the outdoors, like this one. So all three of these kids got to go down there and talk about their project, present it, and answer some questions, kind of in a session like this, actually. <laughs> so since then, we've actually continued to work with these youth and other youth as well uh, on a variety of projects. 
So all three of the kids that, were, that did this video, they're actually now doing all, all sorts of projects. Right on top there, that's Sam Taktu and I, out on the Indoko River just last weekend, or it was probably about five days ago now. It's a very recent trip, and we we're, uh, we're doing a project involving the bison introduction in the Indoko River area, which, was, uh, which just happened last year, actually. There's a group of bison that were released, and they are now, like, uh, it's an experimental population, so they're watching as they... Uh, as they expand their range, the fishing game is. And so Sam talked to and I went to the, the community of Shagalik's, communities of Shagalik and Grayling in that region and did some work with the youth filming uh, local perspectives on the basin and the scientific work that's being done by fish and game biologists. Uh, right on the bottom left, that's Sam Burnett's filming marine debris out there. Actually, he's probably taking a picture of some of the grass there, it looks like, I don't know. <laughs> And on the right is Andrew Kennedy filming a subsistence activity, which happened about two weeks ago in Anaktivik Pass. And this was part of a larger BioBlitz event that happened, which is kind of a 24-hour or 36-hour event where scientists try and document as many species of plants and animals as possible within a certain area. And so uh, we had an additional subsistence activity because Alaska is Alaska, and you can't not include subsistence in the, that kind of event. Oops. And I believe Sean Tibiba has some more to talk about with youth outreach, so I'll give the makeover to Sean Tibiba now. Thanks. And thanks for everybody for coming out tonight. I appreciate it. So as Dave Dunham talked about, we do a lot of work with youth that are involved or interested in videography and creating videos themselves. Uh, but we do a lot more work just with youth in general, um, getting them into parks, whether it's volunteering or uh, working with the park service on something relating to their studies. So what I'll talk about first is last summer there was an Alaska-wide effort to clean up marine debris all along the coastline. So the state got involved, federal agencies were involved. I think there were five national parks uh, that cleaned up debris that washed up from the Japan tsunami. And just generally, there's a lot of trash in the ocean that washes up periodically. So it was a little trash cleanup. And uh, what I'll talk about, I was able to travel down to Yakutat in the southeast and then to Wrangell St. Elias coastline with this group of students. So. There were about three students from Yakutat in the town, and then I think six or seven kids from Interior Alaska with Youth Conservation Corps it brought a lot of different organizations together, um, and the kids all helped pick up trash. There was a good bit of support staff helping with camping and uh, cooking food, so here's a picture of the one guy in the middle, Isaac, uh, who lives in Yakutat, is trying to carry some foam buoys and they're stacking them up tall. And so to uh, give you guys some more background on that trip, I'll show you this video about their experience that summer. Super cool. I'm Alexis Hutchinson. I'm Riley Flint. Andrea Quagley. I'm Angel. My name is Lydia Ashley. I'm Dylan Pollock. My name is Riley Somerville. My name's Isaac Robert John Larson, and I am from Yakutat, AK. Yakutat, Alaska. I'm from Anchorage. I'm from Tennessee. I'm from Kenny Lake, Alaska. Kenny Lake. Kenny Lake, Alaska. Palmer, Alaska. What brings you out here? What brings me out here? Well, 
We're just cleaning up the debris. There's a bunch of it that shows up on the shores, and I mean, it has to be cleaned up at some point. <laughs> Can't just leave it out here in this beautiful wildlife. We're all out here at YCC, the Youth Conservation Corps from uh, Wrangell St. Elias National Park. I'm with the SCA, which is the Student Conservation Association. And I'm working out of YTT right now. It's a uh, Yak Attack Clinket tribe. Yeah, YCC is really fun because we get to be outdoors a lot and we get to explore and have fun with each other, which is great. And some fun things that happened was rolling a 200 pound dot buoy all the way up the beach. <laughs> we pushed it all the way there and it's a whaling because it's so big it takes four people to push it. So we ended up just getting four people and transitioning on who pushes it. <laughs> Playing a lot of games in camp was fun. Basically the whole trip was fun. Everybody got along great, found a bunch of cool stuff and was able to help out the environment. Last week we went to the outer coast in Yakutat and we cleaned up a bunch of garbage on the beach there and we got a lot of trash, like I can't even believe how much we got, it was crazy. It felt tiring, but the way it like looked afterwards, it was amazing, like I couldn't believe we got so much trash. Last week, it was pretty hard. We found a lot of garbage, and we had to walk to one stream, and then we did a zigzag formation from the berm, to the edge of the sand, just back and forth. It was hard. It was kind of like a desert. The food was good. Food was always good. Me and this other kid, Dylan, once we got all the trash together, we had to weigh it, and it ended up coming to about 5,000 pounds. We actually found parts of a three-wheeler. Yeah. We found a lot of stuff. There was tons of different bottles in different languages, like Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Russian, Greek, uh, there's stuff like that. Uh, there's bottles, buoys, some old wood. That's pretty much it over here, though. It felt pretty good. 5,000 pounds is pretty crazy. Yeah, but it definitely felt nice leaving the beach a lot cleaner. I have a passion for the ocean and I hate to see it so dirty and us just polluting it all the time. So it felt really good to get it cleaned. All right, so that was a pretty amazing opportunity for those high school kids to get to a really remote place and experience a lot of new things. Most of the kids being from interior Alaska had never seen, some of them maybe made a trip down to Seward or have seen mountains and water like that, but it was a pretty beautiful place and uh, they worked really hard and we were able to pick up over 5,000 pounds of marine debris in about a week. So another uh, youth-involved project here in Fairbanks every year uh, for the Yukon Quest, this third grade class at U Park Elementary uh, sends a poster out to Yukon Charlie National Preserve, and the Park Service hangs it up in a cabin there that's a uh, stop for the mushers. It's a dog drop. It's not an official checkpoint, but most uh, mushers stop there and spend the night so that poster in the middle behind the kids is the poster that was out in Yukon Charlie. Each student in that picture wrote up a little postcard, those little white boxes you see. And it's a little, they're all little notes to the mushers, something nice, uh, rooting them on. And they each picked a musher to follow. So I, myself and Dave Dunham were out in Yukon Charlie during the quest and we were able to film some of the mushers and their uh, responses to the poster. And so, um, I'll show you a video that we showed to this third grade class.
Hey kids, uh, this is Brent Sass. I'm here resting at Slavin's Roadhouse uh, during the Yukon Quest and uh, having a great run. And we're getting ready to, to head out and head towards Eagle. Got all 14 dogs and uh, looking forward to the journey ahead. Enjoy following the Yukon Quest. I'm uh, Tony Angelo. I'm one of the mushers in this year's Yukon Quest, and I'd like to wish the third grade class uh, congratulations for recognizing this is a great event, and we're glad that we've got your support. Thank you. Paige Drobny, and I'm running the Yukon Quest 2016. I'm out, I'm out at Slavin's Cabin, and um, we just ran from Circle. Um, it's about a 60 mile run, and through some crazy jumble ice, and um, I got a little bit beat up on the way here, but. So it's always nice to have Slavens here that's warm and has good hospitality. So thanks for following. I'm Laura Meese and I'm from McMillan, Michigan. For any uh, like younger kids that might be interested in mushing in the future, like what would be your like number one tip for them? Do you think you'd have one? <laughs> Do it. Don't be afraid to start, and um, yeah, just learn everything you can. Get in contact with some good mushers, and um, go for it. Tore, T O R E. Okay. Tore from Norway. And what's your last name? Albrechtsen. Did you have a good stay at Slavens? Yeah. Yeah. Good. good. This was very good place to come. <laughs> awesome. I like the building, I like the history, and uh, I find it very, very good someone are you know, taking care of places like this. Ninja guy running a dog. On yours. So that was the video we showed the class. They were pretty excited to see it. I think they had a lot of fun watching the video and uh, asking questions. Seeing their, they all got pretty excited when they saw their mushers' uh, names pop up on the video. So since we work for Gates of the Arctic, we get to travel to Anaktuvik Pass for projects probably more than other places that we go to. And so I think starting in November 2014, we were up in Anaktuvik Pass for a big project involving the community of Anaktuvik Pass. There were two students in this picture from Effie Cochran, uh, early college charter school here in town that came up with us. And it was all centered around a caribou butchering with one of the elders there, Rachel Riley. And um, so they butchered the caribou. There were elementary school students that showed up to watch it and learn about butchering caribou. And then there were two students from Anaktuvik Pass from the Nunamute School who helped with the butchering. So there's a video about that as well to document that whole experience. My name is Kumi Rattenbury and I'm a ecologist. I work for the Park Service in Fairbanks, Alaska. And uh, mostly I do large mammal 
stuff up in the parks north of town, Gates of the Arctic, No Attack, Coac Valley, Cape Cruz and Stern, Bering Lambridge. One of the park ecologists, Joe Keeney, approached me and Marcy, our subsistence coordinator, and asked if there was a way to get a caribou skeleton or sheep skeleton um, into the collections, an entire skeleton, so that they could compare it with archaeological artifacts that they're picking up at Matcharak and other sites in the upper Noatak uh, River Valley. So they wanted to compare bones or bone fragments that they found to identify what sort of animals people were eating out there and maybe learn a little bit about hunting practices. So we wanted to work with the community of Anaktuvik Pass to also make it an educational program. I'm Sue McCullough. I'm the Early College Coordinator here at Effie Cochrane Early College Charter School, and I work for the University of Alaska Fairbanks. My involvement, I was contacted by Kumi and Marcy from National Park Service, our neighbors here at Effie Cochrane, to find students who would be interested in going to Anatubic Pass. My name is Sulemi Juarez. I go to Effie Cochrane. Sue McCullough from um, my college coordinator. She usually just offers me opportunities to go to trips to different places if it involves with archaeology or anything that involves with my college interest. So then some of the high school students from Anaktuvik Pass and also the students that traveled with us from Effie Cochran, they sat down with Rachel Riley, who's an elder in the community. She's also on the Gates the Arctic Subsistence Resource Commission. And they butchered a caribou skeleton from, from start to finish. I think it was really good for the kids because the kids, some of the teachers brought their kids to the home ec and they were really interested in watching the caribou get cut up. Because some of the kids actually have never seen a caribou being butchered or people cutting up, you know, cutting it up and stuff like that. And I think that was really good for them. We're taking the meats out and water box those. I think we all learn a little bit as as every time we cut our like butcher caribou, we just learn at least something about them that they tell us what to do and we'll remember it. It's truly a different food than anything else. I feel like it provides for my soul and makes me strong. How does the meat taste? It tastes great. We always do that outside. We just share and uh, the fat is called cow nut. And the uh, meat is too, too cold, I believe. And we, we eat it raw, too. We also dry them. Well, that's what a lot of people here does because it tastes so great. It's called bunny. And the one in the bone, inside the marrow, is called burton. It's really good. We had the opportunity to help elders there too. Oh, Rachel Riley, man, I could work with that lady all day long. I, she is amazing. She was an amazing elder. She's really knowledgeable and she was good with the students. The Soul Lake was one of the greatest ever persons I know. Hidden elder. Who are the elders now? Because she's a great teacher. She knew everyone. She really opened it up. And she wanted us to learn. And I'm great for that. Should we take off stuff like just a little bit of fat or can I just go in to the There's a bone marrow right there. You slide. Should I flip it? Yeah. Not that necessary. She taught us. Well, she told me how to use the ulu, so that is me is incredible. I found it really interesting when she turned to Sulaimi and realized she was struggling with that knife. 
because she gave those girls a really delicate task. She handed her that ulu, and Sulaimi had, after watching, Sulaimi had been watching her use that ulu, she just picked it up. Rachel's, you know, just kind of handing it over to her, like, here is a better tool. Use this tool, it'll go much quicker. Let me see, and she was able to whip off all those little caribou ankles. In the cooking class, they got together and made a big stew from the caribou meat, and they also got to make donuts with another one of the elders in town, and that was served at school lunch one of the days, and then the rest of the meat was donated to different people in the community. So the students actually all went out together and, and visited some different households and um, donated meat to different people in the community. The exchange with Effie Hawkins was really good. Those girls, they were really respectful. They followed direction well, and I thought it was great to have other students that don't experience the same stuff that our students might, you know, to come here and actually see it and to take part in the activities that happened that week. I think that was great because it kind of pulled people together and um, taught, kind of taught the kids how to work together. We were working on book work, but they were learning valuable skills of you know cooperation and cutting up meat, even though they were cutting up the meat off of every single bone. <laughs> but you know, even sharing the stuff, um, having to, to deliver the meat to the elders, um, that was really good. When we went to give out the um, some caribou meet um, I got to talk to some elders and they were really like happy to see us you know give them some meat and have time to do that for them so yeah I, I felt happy that we kind of made them happy so that's that story um, we get to do a lot of outreach so that's just a few videos that show different perspectives whether it's the marine debris uh, students volunteering their time to pick up trash or the third grade class that uh, gets to send a message out to mushers every year or the uh, more pre-planned project like the caribou butchering where we brought in students from Fairbanks and involved kids in Anaktubik. Um, then more recently, a couple weekends ago, they've done a mention, one of the students in the Yellow Balloon video, Andrew, uh, was up in Anaktubic Pass for this BioBlitz. So that was this big scientific inventory effort over a, just a weekend. And another student, Sarah, who's seen here filming, she was also involved in that. So the, Sarah lives in Anchorage, so she was able to travel up all the way to Anaktubic along with Andrew, and they filmed a lot of the activities there. We don't have a video yet since it just happened, but uh, we're excited to see what they come up with. Uh, this is just one of the challenges that we face as videographers working with youth. Uh, and the last thing I'll talk about is we, this spring, I guess this semester, we got involved with a Lathrop High School media club through 4-H, if you've heard of the 4-H organization. Uh, these three guys right here, along with two other girls who um, were in and out with the club, these guys did some activities in town, uh, they got to visit the ice park, and we came to the museum for a day. They were able to go to a 4-H conference that brought in people from all across the country, even the lower 48, up here to talk about 4-H. And they were they filmed that event. They filmed and took pictures at the ice park. Um, they filmed at the un at the museum, and they're just really interested in media, but. Uh, Maybe they didn't expect to be that interested in me at the start, but I think the coolest thing about the club was that these students have, um, since they joined, they really just enjoyed having something to do after school, and their grades have improved since they were in first involved. So I think it was pretty cool to just see something like that. Giving them an outlet after school got them to uh, just improve their overall success in school. So these are two of the guys at the conference getting their film set up ready. So that's about it. Thanks for coming. Um, I think we'll open it up to any questions you guys have at this point. Sorry. Um, I think 
I think for the BioBlitz, for example, to get students to come up for videography for that, they had them write like an essay, and then they kind of chose who was interested. Um, yeah, it's different for every project, but I know that was one of the ones specifically where we had like a sort of a contest sort of uh, competition, I guess. Uh, so the BioBlitz is one that's happening all summer. There was the BioBlitz we talked about in Anaktuvik. There's also going to be one. It was actually that weekend they had BioBlitzes all across the country in the lower 48, but since Alaska summer doesn't really start till later, uh, Denali is going to be doing one later in the summer. Kenai Fjords um, will both be with those, and I think Andrew Kennedy, who we mentioned earlier, is going to be helping film those. Um, Bering Lambridge National Preserve is doing a BioBlitz in July. Any others? There's quite, yeah, there's a project in, based out of Kotzebue um, this summer studying lagoons, and hopefully we're going to bring some uh, a local from Kotzebue out on that to film. And then I think Andrew, maybe, on another, another week might be out on that. It's true. <laughs> Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, these various productions, so are they, uh, let's say, put on some kind of exchange basis with various school districts? Like, you know, one connects with the past, would be available to show them, uh, let's say, Green Lake or Catch Can or something like that? Um, I'm not sure about in the school districts. We put everything out on social media to kind of, that's how we usually share videos. We put it on YouTube and we'll share our link with uh, that caribou video. We actually, when we were up for the bio blitz, we distributed some DVDs just personally, but mostly it's on the internet is how we distribute it just publicly. Any other questions? I wish I could. I wish I could answer that. I just. Um, I think I should want to. Yeah. Uh, so, the Marine Debris Project that was like a large base fund film that actually was came from Japan. So the Japanese government gave some funds to Alaska, the state of Alaska to clean up marine debris because of the tsunami that happened there. And it, I believe that the, um, some of the funding from that like, base fund was used for the videography of the film too. Yeah, the Japanese government they because. It wasn't just the Park Service involved in that. That was the state had cleanups as well, and they had a helicopter and a barge that started, I think, in Kodiak and went all along the coast, all the way down to Seattle. And they, yeah. And I think, I mean, there were other funding sources. Probably Alaska Geographic is involved with a lot of the Park Service uh, funding efforts, I think. Yeah, we tend to find uh, some videography as far as videography is on scale. Uh, we'd like to think so. I mean, can film uh, no. yeah, one day maybe. Next year, <laughs> sure, yeah, next year. <laughs>
Yeah, I think that we're, we're, we're working on that, but uh, it's, it's like a kind of constant process. Uh, I think our films, um, as we do more out outreach events like this, even, they, they receive more and more by the local and maybe even the national, international community. I think uh, having our films like shown at like the Alaska Film and where we do youth photography projects, that's really helpful because you know, a lot of people have, have taken that Schlepping equipment and things like that. Do you have robust <laughs> instruments that you know handle Alaska's river? That's why we get the youth to come out with us. So they can <laughs> carry all our gear. No, I think so sure it's a group effort. Yeah. Big backpacks. Yeah. Yeah, we, we definitely end up carting around quite a bit of equipment. Uh, we take free rides as often as we can get them. Yeah, we have maybe, we really only have two uh, dedicated video cameras. Everything else is a DSLR that does both photo and video. So we do a lot of photography along with video. That's kind of an instant thing you can share as a photo. And then video, you know, is long-term production. So we like to have both. But sometimes it is easy, especially with the youth, to just hand them a video camera. And that has all the components. You know, it's simpler to use than a DSLR most of the time. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sean, Paul, and uh, Dipto and Dawson.